Hi, I'm Nimoy Rao, and this is a new interview series we're doing at the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneuring Excellence, where we talk with entrepreneurs about building uh, their companies and their careers. And uh, this interview, we're with David Breslauer, who's one of the founders of uh, Bolt Threads and currently the Chief Science Officer. Uh, Bolt Threads is engineering the next generation of high performance fibers and raised over $90 million, including a large Series C. Uh, $50 million round this past summer. They have investors such as Founders Fund, Foundation Capital, and Formulation, uh, Formation 8. I'm very pleased to have him here with me today. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so I'd like to start everything with where are you from? What inspired you to go into STEM? Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm from the Bay Area. Grew up uh, in Oakland. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I was inspired to go to STEM so much as that I always knew. Or I was always, it was my bent. I was one of those kids who loved playing with Transformers, taking things apart. Not necessarily the one who always put them back together, but uh, uh, then we got a computer in the house and started playing with it and learning from there. Uh, I, my biggest transition was from computer science into molecular biology. Uh, which was when I decided I was less interested in computers for computer's sake and more interested to use them as a tool. Um, and my evolution has gone from there. Very cool. At Bolt, your process of synthesizing silk fibers come from the idea of silken threads spiders spin in their webs. How did this work originally get started? Um, you know, when I was in graduate school, uh, I was in a microfluidics lab, so building small scale devices uh, in order to manipulate cells and molecules on their general size scale. At the time, biomimetics was a very hot topic. How can we copy nature in engineering to build better systems? What can we learn? Um, and my advisor and I were talking, and he said, you know, how do, how do spiders make fibers so easily. Um, and I got to digging and found an enormous body of literature of people, um, zoologists, biologists, spider scientists, trying to understand how, how this organism works. Um, a curiosity sort of became an obsession there and I just happened to be extremely fortunate that there were two people across the bay at UCSF while I was at Berkeley who uh, were also similarly passionate about understanding how this silk molecules behave um, in such complex fashions. When people think of spider webs, they think of Spider-Man, as right. you said in your talk, and most times they say, okay, it's harder than Kevlar, it can stretch, it's elastic like yoga pants. When you guys were looking at this technology, where did the inspiration come from of, oh, let's take this into textiles and apparel? So a couple different things. We started in the same way most anybody does when they approach the field, which is spider silk is this extremely technically unique fiber. If you can make it, it certainly has a technical application. The common thing people say is bulletproof vest, the imag imagining a lighter yet strong bulletproof vest. The challenge with that is that no one had ever made enough silk or gotten enough spider silk to test whether or not it worked in a bulletproof vest. And if you thought of other arenas um, in terms of composite materials, you, know, you don't want to just throw this in an airplane wing and see what happens. There's a huge testing cycle. We eventually got to, one of my co-founders, his wife um, is a designer at Old Navy, started thinking about this notion of there's a lot of really interesting low-hanging fruit in apparel. We can make some great materials that people have never seen before that will really make quite unique products. And it's a much easier, lower risk um, to enter the market and sort of equally fascinating scientific problem in terms of making these materials. So we decided to take that approach um, because of the, it, it's a synergy between the business and the technology. When onboarding scientists and engineers who don't exactly have a background in textile manufacturing, what are some of the uh, learning curve for them as you bring them on? How do you transition them to get exposed to this new field that they may not have been exposed to? You know, it's an interesting question because there used to be a lot of research, in, even in the United States, in fiber manufacturing, and there's not so much anymore. That means there's still manufacturing, but it's a very small group of people who study fibers. 
Um, so we have to train a lot of people up on fibers and then train them into how uh, are garments made, how are they manufactured. We found so long as you get a curious group of people, they want to learn. And so bringing in experts, originally we just saturated ourselves with knowledge um, until we started hiring in people who knew enough and could start teaching our team uh, what they need to know and guide them in the right direction. How did you and your co-founders start learning more about the fashion industry? You know, really just started with asking people questions, finding uh, Dan, my co-founder, his wife's friends who are also designers, asking them questions and just picking at it until we found people that continued to not just be fonts of knowledge but intellectual partners and then bringing them on board at the company. When you have these two completely different types of people, we have the creative people on the fashion right. side, especially with Gap, you know, maybe everyone's concentrated here, and then very analytical people. How did they mesh together? How did they work together? How did they learn from each other? How do you enable them to be more effective as a team? And that cross-disciplinary work, how did you make it work naturally with them? Um, I think the biggest uh, benefit uh, to maintaining those, that collaboration is transparency in terms of, and when I say that I mean helping each team understand the value of what the others are doing and sharing what one another is doing. It actually turns out to be, from what I've heard of other, from other entrepreneurs who have to build up massive sales teams, very similar to um, trying to get an engineering and a sales culture aligned only because the the personalities tend to be very different but each has a role and an extremely valuable role and it one enables the other so getting both sides of that aisle to understand and appreciate that and I think most people at the end just find the others fascinating the others work fascinating hmm. uh, generally they always say the polyester fabrics in our shirts are always the ones that end up in landfills <laughs> Now these newer sustainable ways of making fibers, uh, they see a change in the textile industry who are wanting to recycle and try to make newer ways of manufacturing. Are we seeing a change in the textile industry at all? We are, we are seeing a slow change. Uh, there is definitely a designer push and a strong consumer pull for more sustainable clothing. Um, there's a, becoming a bit of a backlash um, on at least uh, from designers against fast fashion because so much material is going to waste, although it's still very appealing to consumers. So people are trying to figure out how to deliver fashion, deliver good clothing at reasonable prices, but in more sustainable ways. But you know, it's happening, it's happening slowly because uh, people don't want to disrupt the existing supply chain too much. Um, Mary Barra, the CEO of General Motors, was on record saying that the next 10 to 15 years in the automotive industry is going to be full of innovation that we haven't seen in 50 years, led by autonomous, and we have Uber, we have Lyft, we have all these new technologies. Uh, are we seeing that similar shift in the textile manufacturing where these are centuries of, and millenniums of essentially, of how we produce silk? Uh, do you foresee the processes led at Bolt will change the old style thinking at textile manufacturing. I think in the immediate term, what you're going to see in the student, on a, the shorter time scale is the introduction of the new materials we're making. Um, what is going to increasingly happen, just just as he said, is the automation of textile manufacturing, um, and as well as the ability to. Uh, shrink the manufacturing in a way to do just-in-time custom fit manufacturing. And there are a lot of people working on different ways to do essentially large-scale bespoke manufacturing. You're seeing in terms of the textile facilities that are being built in the United States, uh, they are heavily automated and now require uh, an order of magnitude fewer number of employees than they would have in the past, which is beneficial in that it allows um, the resurgence of, a, of the textile manufacturing within, within the United States. At the consumer level, do you foresee uh, when people are shopping and that, that brand loyalty, are they going to switch brands when they see uh, brand sourcing more sustainable and newer ways of building fabrics and putting their clothing together? 
we are seeing a lot of that, um, particularly on, amongst certain demographics of, of more affluent and uh, eager to improve the environment types, people who, people who can afford it. Uh, the real change will come when uh, you can start selling those benefits within a mass market product. Uh, as you now shift gears from more of high level and scale up, what are some different approaches in your team that you're doing uh, to now shift gears from development now we're doing commercial processes? How are ways that you are telling your team to kind of refocus and revamp up and try and kind of change the direction? Yeah, um, you end up shifting from a little bit less of an innovation and discovery mindset to more of a reproducibility um, and quality control mindset and understanding why things vary, how things vary, and how to maintain consistency and quality at the largest scale um, so that you are able to make a product um, over and over again and deliver it. And we're kind of going to end with uh, daily habits. Mm -hmm. As a founder, what are some of your habits that you do that really allow you to afford time management, uh, mm -hmm. help you succeed? Because we all have so much limited time. Right. As a founder, you're doing many hats. What are some things that you like to do when you wake up and what you do through the day to really allow you to succeed at the work as well as work-life balance? Right. Um, it's interesting. It's evolved over the years. Uh, I found it very beneficial to get out of the office whenever I can. Um, just even even offsites out of the city, just taking a step away really opens up your brain to stop thinking within the confines of the thinking you had. You've sort of ingrained yourself to think within the office. Um, I can I can only go away so often, but it's definitely uh, beneficial. I have some of my best ideas when on the weekend or when I'm on vacation or when I go off site. Um, the other thing is delegation. Uh, just helping grow your people uh, while at the same time distributing work and allowing them to own certain projects and the outcomes of those projects and allowing them to fail safely. That frees up my time, that allows them to grow um, and so everybody ends up doing better for it. Thank you David. Thank you.